And it is now time for the panel. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry for the slow start. We had some technical difficulties, as you can tell by the three of us fumbling into each other. So we're now going to start. So obviously we got the title of the presentation. So, for any... I'm, I'm Matt Farnley. I'm part of the Kaiju Transmission Podcast. Hey, uh, I'm uh, Kevin Derendorf. I write for a blog called Maser Patrol. I also wrote a book called Kaiju for Hipsters. As long as we're plugging products here, I think that's in the spirit of the panel. <laughs> uh, my name is RJ Exon. I am not affiliated with either of these two, aside from just being friends with them, but I run a YouTube channel called Boats Can Fly, and it is a disaster. <laughs> so let's get into the nitty gritty. So for anybody that wants to say that Bandai shilling their products and their shows is a new development, first off, it wasn't always Bandai, but we do have a long-standing tradition of toys showing up where they're probably not supposed to be. <laughs> this is, that's one of two different shows that has an Ultra 7 figurine like inspiring a child on their deathbed, and neither of those shows is actually Ultra 7. <laughs> It's obviously gotten worse, as you can see. We have the spark doll of Ultraman Toro, and he's in jail because he's a very bad young man. <laughs> we have the card reader from Ultra Galaxy, and then we have Ultraman Orbs Frying Pan. Yeah. So we're <laughs> yeah, the big difference here is that like you, it used to be like, oh, it's fun. You, there's like a little product placement, a, a figure or something in the background. But lately, it seems like, oh no, this is plot relevant. This is like. Oh, the, the main hero cannot do their job if they don't have the toys on screen. Just like in real life. <laughs> so, all right. So a couple years ago, uh, Kiyosaka Taguchi actually came to GFS. He's director, director of Ultraman X, and we actually got to interview him. And one of the things that we brought up was basically how Bandai uh, forced what they wanted into the show. So the, the concept was they would give him the designs for the Ultra, the ways they would transform. In addition to that the different weapons they would use and the smart dolls and then they would have to craft material around that. So you're starting with basically toys and merchandise first and then you're going to go into the show. And so imagine being a director trying to put together a cognitive um, a show that makes any bit of sense and you're being hamstrung into using, okay, we have to have this smart doll that becomes a monster. How do we make that work? We have to have this henshin device. How do we make that work? And as, a, as that show progressed, there was more armor, there were different monsters, there was all the different kinds of concepts they had to actually introduce. So when you're thinking about Bandai and you're thinking about Ultraman, you have to understand that they influence the way the show is being written. They influence the way the directors are able to handle that. And so it makes things kind of precarious and difficult. And directors basically like, look, I'm going to do the best I can with what I have. Not so much in Genghis case. <laughs> so here we have some, some straight up numbers. As you can see, Ultraman isn't doing particularly hot as far as this list is concerned, but it is still in the top earners, so they are making money from it. All right, so we're going to go through a little bit of history uh, for Bandai. So founded in 1950, um, they basically, they licensed Astro Boy, which a lot of people in the probably know. And then 1971, they actually have Poppy, which is a, a subsidiary of Bandai. Uh, they launched the uh, Chikogan line. Then they have Gashapon, then they, should, then they introduced the 1980 Gunpla. Then they did um, Bandai Visual. So Bandai Visual actually introduced the first OVA, which is that one. So I don't know if you know, I think you about that Yeah, yeah, it was uh, directed by uh, Mamoru Oshii. So it's sort of a big deal, but, you know, the first direct video animated movie, sort of, you know, that's, that's a debate we could have <laughs> on, on other things. But uh, Bandai was involved in, in the first major high profile one. Well, then they started going into video games. They put out the Wanderers for the Wonder Swarm, which is basically, I think it was Nintendo handheld. That's what they, they came up with. And then they merged with Namco, which is a big producer of video games. So you start seeing Bandai basically align themselves to put out stuff in anime, and they start putting out video games, and they have all the different merchandise. And eventually those things start filtering directly into the show so they can make more money. It's kind of like the blog where it just grows endlessly <laughs> and destroys everything around it like a plague. So very nice. So, do, do these words make sense to people when we say Gashapon and Chogo yeah. and things like yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yep. We, we got the right audience. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 
So the history of Subarai in 1963, founded as an independent studio for Subarai, who was obviously the man that did the effects for the early Showa Godzilla movies. I don't think I need to tell any of you guys that. It's relatively common knowledge for the crowd in this room. Then we've got Ultra Q as the first show in the franchise, and followed by Ultraman. Oddly enough, a lot of the concepts in the show first debuted in stage show before being actual series, but that's a topic of discussion for a different day, I suppose. Next up, Eiji Tsuburaya himself kicked the bucket. He passed away. He died. And then he, <laughs> leave this he, leave. he left this company to his children, who then also proceeded to die. The 1980s, we got nothing because we forgot. And then towards the middle kind of sort of the end of the Heisei era is when Ultraman started to come back. It took a hiatus sort of after Ultraman 80 and then came back with Tiga, which they promoted super hardcore, then followed by Dyna, Gaia. Then it kind of died off a little bit in the late 2000s. It started just being movies for a couple of years. Then it came back and Bandai cannibalized it. <laughs> I don't know if we forgot the 80s. I think the Super Rock. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we ran out of money. We spent it all on Ultraman 80. So uh, we, we associate Bandai, you know, you go to the dealer's room and look around, like, very, very highly with the franchise, but actually they weren't uh, intertwined at first. Uh, it was initially a Mars on that had the license, and if you look at the old uh, figures and stuff, you know, the really old, really expensive figures, and Bandai's not involved with those. It wasn't until uh, 1977 when uh, Bullmark uh, basically went bankrupt uh, that uh, Bondi managed to get a hold of that license and uh, then they were off to the races. So I don't know how many people remember Godzilla's Gang, um, <laughs> but ironically Godzilla's Gang was a lot of Ultraman monsters like I'm looking on here and I see King Joe. So, they were more realistic sculpts that Bullmark had previously done, and then they were across the U.S. And of course, this was kind of in that weird time where bands were, uh, Super I wasn't making any shows. This was 1978. I think the gap was between 1974 and 1979, uh, where, there, where there weren't any shows. So, kind of a weird idea that Godzilla's gang would just be a bunch of monsters that have never actually been in Godzilla movies. Next, we have the Ultra Kaiju series. So these are more affordable monsters, but they have the little tags on them, so you get more information from those. 1983, they actually introduced um, model kits. 94, they moved their production to China, so less cost, also softer plastic. 2003, we started getting the Ultra Kaiju 500 series, which the figures are then smaller, more affordable, and then we start talking, we're going to talk about this in a second, but they add the spark belt. Also, fun fact, the uh, line got renamed to Ultra 500 when Ginga was airing. Then after they retired the Spark Doll gimmick, they just rebranded the line and cannibalized the old Ultra Heroes and Kaiju series line. So now that's just what they're like permanently. This is all you, uh, none of us know about this. <laughs> so one of, one of the first uh, real uh, Bandai Tsuburaya like, uh, multimedia collaborations was this uh, Ultraman Super Fighter Legend, where uh, basically they came up with these toy lines, you can see here, of little tiny figures, they're like an inch tall, that had snap-on armor, it's basically they looked at Kinnikuman, or it was called Muscle in the U.S., uh, millions of unseen creatures lurking everywhere, yes. uh, and then they uh, they also took the, the Saint Seiya was another popular franchise, the Knights of the Zodiac for South American people here. Uh, so, it's okay, we have this one toy line and this other toy line, let's smack them together, and they come up with this Ultraman toy line, this little figure that's half snap on armor, uh, and they adapted that into a manga, and then they actually adapted it into an anime, and it's awesome, actually. Yes. <laughs> uh, Interestingly enough, I believe the manga still runs to this day, That's correct. and it's very bizarre. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's these really cute designs, they have this armor, doesn't look anything like the uh, the Ultraman shows in live action, but it's, uh, it's a lot of fun if you ever want to check it out. Okay, this is a personal area of expertise of mine. Bandai begins co-producing Toei superheroes. So it started with Toei and then kind of gravitated over to Subaraya. Now, interestingly enough, 
the two franchises, Ultraman and uh, Toei Superheroes, follow essentially the same roadmap as far as toy scheduling is going, but Ultraman is missing a step since they're way shorter. So the way it works is you've got the quarter one, quarter two, and quarter three. Now quarter one is going to be like your basic first three for Ultraman for Kamen Rider. It's a little bit different since they have more episodes to work with for the gimmick. But then you've got your first upgrade form, which is usually the end of quarter one. Then quarter two is your super forms, and then quarter three is going to be your final forms. Now, usually how it works for Subaraya shows is they cut the center out since they have half as much content to work with. But it's pretty much the same basic principle as far as the two are concerned, because they both go through Bandai and Flex for their props and their designs. Yeah, you'll see a lot of, uh, we, we call it common riderification of the Ultraman franchise there are certain elements that are in Kamen Rider that sort of get brought over to Ultraman as the, uh, as the years go by, and especially as, as Bandai's influence does. And I think uh, this is an anecdote that applies to Kamen Rider and not necessarily to Ultraman, but I think it's just too perfect to leave out, is uh, there's a show called Kamen Rider Gaim. And for that show, they got their one of the hottest writers in Japan, who was, who's just off of Madoka Magica and Psycho Pass, which are huge anime series. They, they brought him on board, and he had this pitch for this Kamen Rider series. They're like, oh, it's going to be like the Warring States era, and there's going to be all of these different tribes vying against each other. And then found that people just sort of like smiled and nodded and said, yes, also the main character is an orange. <laughs> <laughs> and he just had to make it work. Yeah, that goes back to, you know, to Yuchi talking about how they just they give you the concept and you got to build it from there. And I, I can't imagine trying to, to make a show that way, but they I, I think they made it work in some cases. Well, presumably that's why the Ginga is such a disjointed, storyless mess, because it's kind of, sort of, the first show they had to work with that blueprint for, and then as it goes on, it starts to get a little bit more structured as they're getting used to having to work under these constraints. And then RB went back to having no plot. <laughs> <laughs> Fragments of hope. So, uh... The, the Bandai stuff wasn't the first, like, super crass commercialization of the Ultraman franchise, because if you ever have seen Ultraman there, uh, that basically began as a series of commercials for the uh, Itamitsu Gasoline Company, and if you look at the entire thing, you know, like, the, uh, the, the defense team is called Mido, that's from the uh, frequent membership cards that they have at this gas station. The, the uniforms are basically gas station attendants because it was... They, their defense team works out of a gas station. Uh, Zayard was their brand of gasoline. Uh, it was famously benzene-free. That's why he fights aliens from the planet benzene. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so yeah, these uh, these movies are, are surprisingly good for <laughs> giant gasoline commercials. But this is definitely the first time you watch Ultraman and like, man, I'm just being sold and sold and sold the product here. As a bizarre non sequitur, he also transforms with a toothbrush. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, he's, he's got to be clean. It's environmentally friendly. Of course, toothpaste is <laughs> my favorite. <laughs> so, now we have uh, Tiga, Dinah, Gaia, 1996 or 1999. Um, these shows borrowed more money in production than they made back. I'm going to come back to Chayo because I think that's something I want you to talk about. But on the merchandising front, each year on these, on these shows starts having multiple forms. So what's that mean? It means more forms. So Ultraman goes through a change, you can sell more merchandise. What do you talk about, Chad? Yeah, so we, we have this, uh, at least apparently successful relaunch of the, of the Ultraman franchise. At the same time, the, uh, the president of the company passes away. And uh, then this other company from Thailand comes out of the woodwork and says, Oh, by the way, um, 20 years ago you guys gave us perpetual rights to the Ultraman. And, uh, Wasn't it that they borrowed money from them at some point? Or yes, that it was. It was that they borrowed money from them to make a movie for them. It doesn't really stand up in court, but uh, they also tried the same thing with Toei, who sent them a cease and desist because you cannot fight Toei in the 1980s and not get sued into oblivion. <laughs> Toei is a much bigger, pow more powerful company. I mean, they, they got One Piece, they got Dragon Ball, they can. They can shoot their Kamehamehas at the... Oh, do you want to talk about the book before we move on? Uh, uh, that book? 
I, I have not actually seen that book, but I, I hear it's, it's full of some interesting things. <laughs> so I will briefly touch on this because I cannot personally read Moon Runes, and the book has not been translated into English. The book is called Ultraman is Crying, and what it basically details is that during this three-year period where Bandai was saying they were making all these record income on the shows, they were making money on shows like Tiga, but they weren't making bank. But they basically fudged the numbers to make it look like they were doing better as to basically keep the public reputation of the company afloat. So the whole golden era of the Heisei Ultras was basically built on a lie as far as I'm aware. Here is a disaster. <laughs> Ultraman Nice. Yes. The greatest misuse of such a gorgeous design. Look at him, he's beautiful. <laughs> and he's relegated exclusively to toy commercials because of course he is. <laughs> so we've got a series of 41 minute toy commercials which oddly enough have their own special effects which are not atrocious. He disappears for about a decade and a half and then reappears as Dr. Egg to sell Bandai's horrifying Ultra Egg toys which then collapsed in on themselves and no longer get made because they're made poorly and they're very ugly. <laughs> so we're going to move on to the very interesting period, which is Cosmos and the Ultra End Project. Now we got disgusting hippie Ultraman, Ultraman Cosmos, <laughs> which ran for a horrifically long 65 episodes, and also ran longer because there is a scandal with the main actor where people thought he was beating his wife, but it was not actually him, it was just a guy that kind of sort of looked like him. <laughs> so they had to put the show on hiatus, run something that was originally only made for DVD, and then bring it back. How you apologize to somebody for doing something like that, I'm not quite sure, because Japan has destroyed people's careers over less. And then we move on to the polar opposite. We've got Hippie Ultraman, and then we've got the most horrifying Ultraman franchise entry in the series, Ultraman Nexus, where all of the main characters have crippling depression, and one of them is dying of some sort of undisclosed genetic disorder. For kids. <laughs> now, the reason Nexus was... Oh, I'm sorry. The reason Netflix is regarded as a failure, despite the fact that it's a fan favorite, is because it started in a children's block, and it scared the hell out of children, because one of the early plot lines is about how the main character's girlfriend is actually dead and possessed by an evil Ultraman that kills a child's parents, and then possesses them to torment their children, you know, the kids. <laughs> they then had to move the show to a different time slot at 2 o'clock in the Japanese morning, where it then got no views. So, it is a financial failure, but is beloved by the fans. But since it made approximately $8, the project was considered a failure. It's really good. Watch it on Crunchyroll. <laughs> Please support the official release. <laughs> so now we have this return of nostalgia from 20, uh, 2005 to 2007. You got Max, the true golden age. The big thing is you start seeing classic monsters and uh, continuity and, and different Ultraman repeat up here in these other shows. Again, more merchandise. They have a kind of updated suits. And then you start looking at um, the final chapters in 1999, Naos. Ultimate Evolution, and then that starts bleeding into kind of additional shows. Because, like, previously the only thing they had with the Showa Ultras was uh, Antigua for the anniversary of the franchise. The original Ultraman shows up in one episode. And then with Xerth, I believe there was something tacked on with all of the original Science Patrol actors where the original Ultraman fights Zeton and he blows him up with a rainbow specimen beam. But that was really all you were getting from the older characters up until this nostalgia boom. Yeah, you, you occasionally get sort of, you know, your one-off like uh, Ultraman versus Common Rider or something like that. But this is really when they're like, all right, 
Who here remembers Ella King? Isn't Ella King great? Go buy a figure of Ella King. Here's a little yeah. tiny baby Ella King that the, the cute female character really likes. Please buy the merchandise. We really need the money. We're going to turn our legs off. He's cuter than Pikachu. Uh, so, similarly at, at this period, uh, when we, we start going backwards in terms of the, the nostalgia of the catering to the uh, people who were watching in the 60s and 70s, Tsuburaya's uh, original sort of different content, uh, e even if it's a even if it's a throwback, you know, like Mirror Man had a Mirror Man Reflex, or there's a new series of uh, Kaiji Ben Uh There was uh, another minor one with uh, Zero's little gaggle of weirdos from the movies, where they're all based off of Tsuburaya's B team, like Glenfire is Fireman, Mirror Knight is a good question. But that's, and that's then, Ultraman in the title, like it's still very much. I get what you're saying. Yeah. So, so I mean, we, we, we're not after this period. We're not going to get another like Bio Planet Wu or uh, Otaske Girl or, or Metal Kaiser. I mean, Metal. Kaiser. We didn't even get Metal Kaiser when it was supposed to be released. Yeah, that was a disaster. But <laughs> the, the the point is, at this point, uh, Super Eye goes bankrupt. The company gets sold, and I think that that's a, another part of this uh, strategy. Is they're like, okay, no more, no more messing around with these new ideas things. These uh, don't make money. This is dangerous. Yeah, read, read, read us Peter Rabbit. So. Bandai <laughs> absorbs Subaraya, so they go from owning a part of the company to almost half of it within the span of about four years, and they own less than 11% of Toei. Oddly enough, they have about the same level of creative control when it comes to their show, so I'm not quite sure how exactly that works out. I understand owning 11% of a company, 11% of one part isn't necessarily 11% of the same part, if you get what I'm saying, so... Yeah, for, for certain properties, you know, with your pretty cure or something, I'm sure Honda can come in and throw their weight around, whereas, you know, if they go to, go to one piece, and then they'll just get laughed out of the room, so... <laughs> So I, I love this slide specifically because if you look at it and you see you see all the designs up top, as you start to get to the bottom, you can basically look at this until when Bandai started coming in and saying, "Hey, we want to make things ours." And you can just, I mean, you look at it and the designs get a bit more glitzy. There's a lot more color. They have all these different markings, yeah. and that's basically reflective of what we actually end up seeing in the shows and the different Ultraman monsters. You there? What can I help you with, sir? Tiger's not on. Yeah, My man Tiger doesn't have an English logo. It just came out two weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> so, 2007, actually I like the show quite a bit, Ultra Galaxy Mega Monster Battle. So one year after the Namco merger, we have this show created, and then they start having the cards in incorporated. So if you're watching the show, a monster appears, a card flashes on the screen and gives monster stats and power levels and different things. So again, more merchandise being thrown directly in this case in your face because it like pops up and it's like right here and they spend a good five seconds <coughs> telling you about the monster. Yeah, this is this is one where there's the card game. You can go to the arcade to play on Namco machines. The card game, and so you put your card down. If, if anyone sees Yu-Gi-Oh, it's basically like that in real life. Uh, can you tell me Yu-Gi-Oh's not real. <laughs> <laughs> Never. <laughs> So yeah, then we then we get this basically show that's it's like Pokemon with, with Ultraman monsters and it's awesome. I can't and wait for us to get the, the like National Dex colon with all of the eggs. <laughs> <laughs> I will be discussing this because I hate this character. <laughs> so we've got Ultraman Zero, who is basically a shonen anime protagonist with an Ultraman color scheme. So the first major project that Bandai Subaraya's horrible amalgamation created was the uh, the movie for Ultra Galaxy, which introduces Zero, and then he's basically the company's mascot up until they decide, no, you're not making us any more money, Orb is more popular in the Chinese market, that is now our mascot, and as you can see, seeing as this is Bandai's first Ultraman, he has to have approximately five billion alternative <laughs> forms. <laughs> We've got the Tector gear and then his regular form. So, straight out of the gate, first movie, already two forms. Then it just keeps getting worse. <laughs> On top of that, he also ties into the nostalgia boom 
because he can't be his own character. He has to be the son of Ultra Seven, except he doesn't act like his dad at all. He's also voiced by a, a Gundam pilot, which is interesting. How do I? Yeah, that guy. He's also the main character in the atrocious Godzilla anime movies. <laughs> It would not fit in the slide, and it already has some overlap. This character is overexposed, and I don't like him. <laughs> he has nothing to hide. <laughs> Alright, so, in 2011, TYO uh, sells their shares at Super Riot to Fields. And you know, just as a purely as a coincidence, at that point, Fields launches their own ma manga magazine, and they're like, Hey, Ultraman, that's like our, our main uh, bread and butter here. <laughs> So, uh, of course, uh, you might know this Ultraman from the, from the manga that's being released in the States, or that terrible... Ultraman. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, uh, uh, as, as true synergy, even though this was not necessarily their division of the, the project, uh, Bondi is also making all sorts of merchandise based on this incarnation, because, you know, it's popular and there's money to be made. Ultraman Retsudan, which has been retired three times, but still miraculously comes back every year when they need something to fill the rest of the six months of the year out. Now what this show is, is they take footage from the older shows. Uh, sometimes they might rescore it, and sometimes you might have these short little vignettes with the suits, and sometimes they'll get some of the voice actors back, but usually it's basically just a way to keep some of the older content in circulation while they're making newer shows. It was also what they used as a springboard for shows like Ginga and X. Originally, they weren't technically their own viewing block. They were just part of Retsudan. But then after X, they decided they were retiring Retsudan. Retiring in air quotes, because if any of you have been following the show since 2016, what they'll do is the show airs for half a year, comes back in July, ends in December, and then from January to about the end of June, they'll do these chronicle shows where it's the same thing as Retsudan, but it's different because it's called something different. <laughs> and that's basically all they've been doing because we had Ultraman Zero the Chronicle after Orb, then we had Ultraman Orb the Chronicle, how you're going to give a character with a 25 show long run a uh, chronicle series. That is also 25 episodes long, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> then we had New Generation Heroes, The Chronicle. After that, I'm not quite sure what they're going to do. Maybe we'll get Booska, The Chronicle. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just have to see where that goes. They should. I hope not. That sounds like a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> so here we have 2013, Ultimate and Ginga S. Uh, reports it airs during the run of Ultimate and Resident. It's also the first show to really heavily featured Bandai merchandise in the show. It's also one of the shortest shows to date. It's only 12 episodes. It also has the worst main lead in the entire franchise. If you watch some of the episodes and you look at his face, he does not emote like a human being. He's he's the actual space alien. You're supposed to think it's Ultraman. It's actually Hikaru's actor. Because he <laughs> smiles when a normal human being would know that is that's not appropriate to do. Like, hey, an alien just kidnapped my friend. <laughs> that's acting. They gave this man money to do this. I mean, they, they didn't have money for multiple days. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's a scene we spent all show. our money on the, the grassy knoll where all the fights are filmed. But there's a scene in the show where one of the one of the monster heads is on backwards, and you're just like, what? How does this? Nobody <laughs> notice? <laughs> There's also a scene where the Ultraman Taro Spark doll commentates a boxing match like Lainey Hart. It's horrifying. <laughs> <laughs> Best is subjective when it comes to the show. So speaking of us. Uh, oh, there he is. Yeah, we, we, should, we should explain what this whole deal is. Um, so we, we, can, we can trace this back again to the, to the Toei thing where... Uh, for the for the tenth anniversary of the Heisei Kamen Rider, uh, they said, uh, "Let's have a really creative idea. Our main character has the power of all the previous Kamen Riders, and he can just transform into them using our our cards." And that show was terrible. But then, yeah, decade. So then, uh, a few years later, they had an idea like, "Hey, that thing we did. Let's do that again with a, a new show called Go Kaiser, 
except let's make it not terrible. And it was actually pretty good. Um, however, they, they rehashed that card idea, and instead of selling cards, they sell figurines. The, the main characters can use these figurines to transform into the previous heroes. Uh, and this is uh, this is crafty because even if you don't watch the shows, you still might want to you know get your your favorite characters and these, these new little affordable figurine forms. Uh, affordable is code for not painted and very soft looking. Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> affordable uh, is, is like two dollars. <laughs> yeah, the five hundred in the name comes from the fact that they're five hundred yen, so about four uh, American USD dollars. It's it's a the plague of, of nerds like us that are like oh, I want a figure with good paint scheme, but I also want it to be five dollars. <laughs> why, why they gotta make all these figurines for children shows like for little kids? I don't get it. What a novel concept! A show for children is merchandise for children. <laughs> a Bandai to Machination who? <laughs> so anyway, uh, they they take it a step further with the with the spark dolls and that. You, these uh, these aren't don't just help the characters transform into the previous characters. These actually are the previous characters. So you know Ultraman Taro, he's, he's the most popular Ultraman from the 70s. Uh, he gets turned into a little doll who can then talk with the main character, and then the main character can use various other dolls to transform into monsters. And, and that way you don't have to make original suits or anything. Yeah, it's not subtle in the slightest. Like at one point in the last episode. They chroma key the spark doll floating in the air, and it's very strange looking. And that's the whole show, basically. <laughs> it's just them tossing this vinyl toy around and having the voice actor begrudgingly do dialogue for it. And, and then they kept this gimmick up for, for Ultraman for X shows. after it, yeah. Here we have the uncle from Ultraman Orb. Now we've got de-emphasized attack teams. Now the reason for this is because making models for tanks and planes costs money. So what we can do instead is take these out and replace them with nothing, <laughs> and then act as if nothing has changed. So for Ginga, no defense team. The military doesn't even show up. You know who the defense team is? There's this police officer on a bicycle. <laughs> That's the defense team for Ginga. And then in Ginga S, the defense team is three dudes in leather jackets with a Toyota Leaf and guns. And then the guns plug into the gas tank and they shoot energy bullets. Now Ultraman X had an actual big boy attack team. And then the toys didn't sell, so then we don't get those anymore. Orb had an attack team, and by that I mean it was in the show, but didn't have plot relevance. So every five episodes you'll see a recolored VTOL from the original Ultraman series show up in the background. And that's it. And that was the last defense team we got, unless you count the weird Men in Black ripoff from Jeed or the very loud screaming man in the white suit from Ultraman RV, <laughs> who was written out of the show 17 episodes in because the actor had a prior obligation. So they thought to themselves, we don't need the main antagonist. We can make this boat float without holes in it. <laughs> I never thought of him as part of the uh, defense team. That's, uh, well, he's rich. All of the weird technology in RV is from him. So that's your sci-fi elements. The rest is just, here's bad folklore. You know the really interesting lore stuff from Ultraman Orb? Let's take that but make it not interesting. <laughs> oh, the, the fun part. Yeah. Fun <laughs> so fun it wasn't enough that we needed multiple forms and transformation devices. Now we started having all these different weapons. And this is just three of them. But I mean. Oh, there's another one that we leaks today. We'll go into that when we're done. <laughs> um, again. You have the you buy the first Ultraman. Now you need to get the, the second form. Now it has to have three different weapons. So now you have five different figures for basically one Ultraman. Imagine parents like me trying to buy those for my son. Well, it gets expensive after a while. But that's what Bandai Bandai wants. And again, I, I go back to thinking about how do the directors handle having this merchandise given them and just say, hey, we're going to shove it down their throats. We don't care how you do it. That's the part that kind of like is totally befuddling to me. So as mentioned earlier. 
with the catalog things, these catalogs leak in very specific parts of the year. So around April, you get the first quarter leaks where it shows the new ultras and their forms. And then usually this weekend, every single year, is when quarter two leaks. Tyga's just got his this morning, and surprise, his final form upgrade thing is a little noisemaker sword. <laughs> so we're keeping it going strong this year too. Let's let's hope for next year we get a winner. That, that's that's a, a key differential. When you when you can look at stuff from the from the 60s and 70s and be like, okay, well, this is the beta capsule of the Ultra Eye. Like they had transformation devices. Uh, some of the Ultra Men did have weapons, but they didn't have weapons that played songs. So they didn't, they didn't have like little little light up duty. We're gonna have Akira Kushida talk to us, but he's a sword. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Victory. <laughs> All right, so we, we talked a little bit uh, about the Mega Monster Battle before, how we had those those card game and things that you could go to the arcade to play. Uh, there's another tie-in, uh, Daikaiju Rush. Um, yeah, it looks like an air hockey Yeah, yeah, pretty <laughs> much. I mean, uh, so this became a series of uh, CGI shorts that they would tack onto movies in the theaters or uh, air as part of Resident. Uh, I actually also sort of really like these because you have these classic Ultraman monsters redesigned with these sort of hardcore versions of themselves, and they, they go out and they, they hunt kaiju, and that's that's the point of the, the shorts, but, but definitely, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm part of the problem, because I saw those, and I'm like, oh, i got to go buy fingers of all these guys. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, the fan favorite Earth Gomero, where he looks like he's just covered in rock candy, and he's called Earth Gomero, even though regular Gomero is also from Earth. <laughs> Uh, sorry. Oh, okay. I see you guys gave me the stinker, thank you. <laughs> Waifus. <laughs> Need I say more? The answer is of course yes. So, it starts off as these busty anime waifu statues where they're kind of dressed as Ultraman monsters. And then for some reason, the statue sold well enough that Bandai was like, hey, we can milk this more, let's make an anime. <laughs> and then they did. It got one season. And the only thing I know about this anime is that Jugglish Juggler's actor was in it for one episode, and then I stopped caring. <laughs> it got two seasons in a movie. Oh, yeah, the, the movie movie's, movie's, movie's coming out. In the theaters. The movie is out. And then got released as a DVD as some sort of store exclusive. There's more manga adaptations than I could count, also. <laughs> oh, I didn't know about that. Yeah, yeah so I mean, if we got the manga, the, the uh, drama CD. There's a English. restaurant where you can go and, and see uh, yeah. him address this kaiju. The voice is a restaurant. Okay, I'm going to go book my reservation. <laughs> <laughs> but if any of you have wanted to see the Earth-eating horrible monstrosity Gatonozoa as an anime waifu, they got you covered. Uh, we got a question. question. Is, is there a big button? Yes, there is. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Here's Wyndham. Uh, Why? Yes, no. Get out. Get out. <laughs> I gotta them off. Every time they add one, I cry a little bit inside. I cry on the outside. <laughs> <laughs> Just a note about that. They, they actually made an English version of the manga. So basically, when the Ultra Monsters die, they go to a high school and they're girls. Yeah. That's what the Kaiju Hakama is! <laughs> this truly is hell! <laughs> they did do a cameo of uh, Ultra uh, Dan Morimoshi. Yeah, I, I think that's the Dengeki version versus the Flex version. There's two different types of the uh, project going on. Yeah, yeah let's let's move move on. On. Moving on. Moving on. Spare our sanity. Ultraman X, uh, 2015 is the last show to air as part of the Shin Ultraman Retsuden. Um, Again, featured heavy emphasis on returning actors. Had the spark, the spark dog, which apparently did not sell, and that's why it's the last thing <coughs> to actually focus on them. I just distinctly remember there's a Gomer episode, and the, and our main character is talking to Gomer, and he's basically like talking about how they're best friends, and that's kind of an ongoing thing throughout the uh, series. There's actually an episode that focuses solely on Gomer becoming a monster again, going out of control, and then going back to being a spark dog. So that's kind of the, the whole concept where the monster are spark dogs. Something happens throughout the entire. Um, series that actually enables them to become monsters on the loose again, and then when the monsters are defeated, they go back into being toys. That's the entire concept of the show. It's actually really well done, 
and there's, there's a good overarching story from start to finish, and I really love um, Grisa. Yeah, Grisa's awesome. That is the best final goal of really, any of the new really, generation show. I, I admire what uh, Taguchi was able to do with the show as much as he had to, to direct it and special effects because of the, the concepts that were given to him, but I feel like, and you guys correct me if I'm wrong on this, this is kind of like the last show that really did well with, the, with having to be using those kind of concepts. I will argue against your case because of the next slide. Matt? I got you. <laughs> <laughs> the next, next slide. We got the big boy zone, Ultraman yeah. Orb. The 50th. <laughs> so, for the 50th anniversary of the franchise, a very special man has appeared. <laughs> Mr. Kurene Guy. Ultraman Orb, so the Smart Dolls are retired, we're moving on to cards, which Poe did first, but they're less obtrusive than little Bandai vinyl, so I'll take it. We have not as much emphasis on the history of the show, I mean, older characters do appear in the basis for the power-ups, but it's kind of de-emphasized from Ultraman X, the characters themselves don't really show up, they're more of just a presence, but... Because of how popular this show was, Guy and Orb replaced Zero as the mascots for the show, which I personally prefer because Orb is not nearly as grating as, I'm so super cool, I got five million alternative forms, please buy all of them. <laughs> it was also the first show to get a spin-off in very many years, so it got Ultraman Orb, the origin saga, which was a terrible. Yeah. <laughs> It was 12 episodes long, was supposed to come to the United States, didn't, <laughs> and the entire series is basically, hey, how long can we spread the Voxium suit, the Arstron? weird Bugman suit, and then the Earthtron suit for 12 episodes, and it's very noticeable. It's also very bad. <laughs> so that's Ultraman Order. We have the Legacy Hero forms, once again Orb, as I was mentioning, they're the basis for the power-ups in both Orb and Jeeb. So we have an overlapping gimmick, two years in a row, very creative Bandai. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I like Ultraman G. My well, son, my son loves G. Oh so. yeah, fun fact, when the name of Jeeb was first leaked, it started as Ultraman Zed with a Z, and then the catalog leaks came and he became Ultraman G for some reason. Not sure what happened there. Katakana? No, there was like an actual English spelling of it. Too. Oh. Anyway, this, uh, this, uh, I, I guess, uh, the idea is, well, you, you guys are already nostalgic for the good old days of Zero, right? So, uh, <laughs> we, uh, we go back to, to that and then sort of continue that story with the this, this guy is the son of the main antagonist from uh, from Ultraman Zero, but then Ultraman Zero shows up as a side character and it helps him out. Uh, I could go on much longer about the the details of the show, but the the one innovation is that uh, now it's it's not cards that they have to, uh, to to collect. You know, you've got to have a completely different set of widgets when the new show comes around because otherwise you, know, you won't be motivated to buy them all. Uh, so instead, now there there are these capsules that they're running around. Each capsule contains the, the soul essence or something of one of the previous uh, Ultraman or, or Kaiju, so that they can use those to transform into them. Because why have a character who can do anything on their own? Disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> Disgusting. <laughs> the first show to not get brought over by Crunchyroll for reasons that we will not go into, because any of you that are interested in the franchise have probably already heard of the Mill Creek deal. Not all at once, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> but, like Kevin was just saying, the capsules, after their long run of a whopping six months, have been retired and are now these dumb little crystal things with wings. And then they turn into elementals, but for some reason the elements have pictures of Ultraman on them, <laughs> because we have to sell them somehow. A little red disc with wings on it isn't going to move units. It has to be a little red disc with wings, 
But Ultraman Taro's there! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it would have been fine if they'd just gone with the elements, but you know, this is like if the Captain Planet Gears were like, Fire, also Ultraman Taro, is also fire. <laughs> water, also Ultraman Ginga, is also water. It's like Nothing. they wanted to de-emphasize the focus on older characters, but they didn't want to lose out on any potential profits, but they did anyway because the show didn't do very well financially. So they just did a very poor middle ground that satisfied neither party. There we go. So, finally, we get on to the golden goose of this year, Ultraman Taiga. We once again have our third son of returning Ultraman character. This time it's Taro's son, because Taro is horrifically popular as seen by the fact that he was the only one to survive Ginga and still be sentient. <laughs> <laughs> now, we once again have the return of the legacy items. This time it's like jewelry themed, so for the Ultras, it's going to be bracelets. For the monsters, it's rings, because uh, Kamen Rider Wizard doesn't exist. <laughs> and it's basically just more of the same kit. There you go. This was not updated because the leaks for the second quarter stuff just came out a couple of hours ago. But, so, how the shows usually do their power-up forms is you've got the balance form, you've got the strong form, and then you've got the fast form. Well, they decided, we're going to keep doing that, but we're going to try to trick the audience into thinking it's something else. So instead of Taiga having three forms, it's just three ultras, which... I mean, it's a clever way to get around it, but it's still the same thing, technically speaking. And then we've got Tregia, who was the main bad guy for the Ultraman RB movie, but since they permanent, <laughs> permanently killed off Belial, they need to have some kind of recurring antagonist. So this freak was born. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I love that this is still playing on the nostalgia thing, but it's playing on, like, different nostalgia... Ve vectors like okay well here here's the guy that's the son of Ultraman Taiga and uh, Ultraman Taro you're skipping into the future that's yeah. not for another ten years yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> and son of Ultraman Taro so you know, all you old fogies who remember the 1970s you know this is this is what uh, you can you can go to and show your kids and be like see isn't this cool uh, then you have the the guy that's from the same universe as Ultraman Orb uh, and then you also have a guy who's from the same universe as the 1970s Sunrise Ultraman anime, which I don't know who the target audience is aside from me and maybe like two other people in this room. But, uh, Jonius! <laughs> but that makes me really happy, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna be suckered into this nostalgia thing just as well. So we have hit the end of our content, so we will now field questions, comments, and or concerns. I'm sure you have plenty of concerns. It's been used several years in a row for like 10 years now. Is there any particular reason why the film has gotten such a recurring role? Gomera is popular. Tell us totally. But he doesn't appear to be the best Gomera does. I assume it's it's Gomera, but he looks kind of cool because Japan really likes their robots. <laughs> they do like their robots. We have one last question. We gotta wrap up. Yep. Well, can I ask the inverse of that? Why has why doesn't Boltan show up anymore? Is is is, is, is he? Do they do they not have the rights to him anymore? Or something? I think I think they're trying to de-emphasize aliens in favor of having a more recurring singular villain, so you don't really get the recurring aliens unless it's like an off plot episode. Yeah. So like for Taiga you've got the the generalized aliens and then it's probably gonna devolve into just Tregia. So that was the panel. Hopefully you all were not too annoyed by my horrible <laughs> show. Nice job.